thank you, Martha. And thanks for the job you do uh, every session to keep us in line and keep us on the air. Uh, and thanks to uh, Stacy and George for uh, subjecting themselves to this grueling <laughs> session. Uh, <laughs> I've known both uh, uh, the Sasses for some time and admired their work. And uh, just like our recent guests, uh, are, they are a couple who have lived and worked together successfully for some time. Uh, and I think that gives us an opportunity to both talk about a couple of different media and about the uh, successes and possible trials of being two artists working side by side and working very closely. Unlike the uh, um, Angela and Emil, they work with very similar subjects and often work side by side. In fact, I learned a few minutes ago that they have a, a brand new home in St. Michael's that they constructed around the idea that they would have working space uh, for both that they could utilize. So that's really uh, an intimate personal and professional relationship. <laughs> so whoever wants to respond first, George and Stacy, why don't you tell us a little bit about your new home and what you did to uh, build that home around the art that you uh, create? Stace, go ahead. Sure. Well, we uh, moved to St. Michael's in July and um, we had been designing this house. Um, well, we designed it about two years ago with uh, Michael Dowling, our Annapolis architect. And the idea being that as we get into our Oh, twilight years, you know, we don't need a lot of space to live in, but we need space to create. And that um, allowed us to go with two studios. Mine is a beautiful space, great lighting over the garage. And then George is just down the hall. Um, and we share the my space as a framing and matting area. But I do, I am allowed to keep it a mess because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we decided, at, we decided at this uh, stage of our life to really design the house around what we, what we do, what we spend our time doing. So uh, right across the harbor, we live on the water in St. Michael's, right across the harbor, there's a beautiful hotel when we have a lot of guests, well, obviously after COVID, hopefully, because we haven't had too many, you know, during COVID, uh, we decided instead of having a lot of guest rooms that are not used often, let's really build some really great studio space, which we use every day. And when guests come that we don't have enough room for, we can get them a hotel room. So we, we are just loving um, having designed a house around what we do. Yeah, well, I think that's great that you've been able to do that. Most of us uh, don't plan that far ahead and, and don't get to that kind of point. Uh, but you have an even, I think, more fascinating backstory. And before I talk to you individually about your own work, uh, could you tell us all a little bit about how it is that you sort of traveled widely and worked side by side while you did that? Okay. Well, okay. Well, um, we, um, we've been traveling together since we pretty much got married uh, 34 years ago, 33 years ago. And um, uh, during our travel, Stacy would paint. And uh, even when I, uh, before I retired, I was a writer and photographer. So I would shoot and write about where we were and uh, 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 for various magazines and Stacy would paint. Um, and we, after we retired, we started traveling more full time. So uh, being uh, avid boaters, we, we actually traveled uh, for one year. We took off work before we retired and traveled for a year on our boat all around uh, the US. Uh, we traveled almost 7,000 miles on our boat. Stacy painted. I, I photographed and, and wrote for magazines. Um, and then after we retired, um, we bought a little uh, RV travel trailer and we traveled across the country doing the same thing. And it was really neat because we find a, a beautiful spot like the Grand Canyon or some of the Utah parks. Um, Stacy goes her way during the day painting and I go my way. 
and we come back uh, and compare things and talk about our work. So it's been a, a great collaboration, if you will. That's terrific. The only, the only thing we have to figure out is who's going to watch the dog. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you have a dog that travels with you all the time? Oh, he sure does. Oh, he sure does. Yeah. Uh, well, my dog might appear along the way, uh, jumping into my lap, but we'll hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> okay. uh, and I wanted to uh, drill into that a uh, little bit uh, and your work, but um, it reminds me of me and my wife. We like to travel, but I go off and shoot and she goes shopping. <laughs> and that actually leads me to my question. When you're so close together, although you go your separate ways, how do you decide where to stop? Who gets the priority? No, I want to stop here and paint or photograph this. Or, or, and at the end of the day, do you come back and sort of compare what you've done? Uh, how, does, how does that work? Well, I think we're very respectful of each other's uh, art. And um, there are times, uh, I can't tell you how many times actually, that uh, I've had my camera, we, we weren't on a serious, I wasn't on a serious shoot, but all of a sudden I just stop and start, you know, shooting. Yeah. And Stacy has shown tremendous patience because she might not have, uh, she might not have her painting supplies with her. Mm -hmm. But vice versa, there are times when she wants to go paint on with her, maybe without my camera, but I understand what she's doing. I think it's a, yeah. having a mutual respect for each other's art form. Yeah. Um, and uh, want to add? Well, I think that if you're, if you're a serious artist, the challenge is up to always find interesting subjects and interesting shapes wherever you go so as you know we've we've gone to beautiful places that you know you it's obvious where that it, there's beauty but i think on the other hand you know you're in other areas and it's up to you as artists to find the beauty or the interest i think i have a real quick question what? for george as a photographer and then i think we'll move on to start looking at some of the works especially the pairs that we've selected where you've been working in the same okay. uh, locale george when you're with stacy and she needs to set up and paint you mentioned you don't always have your camera with you did i get that right that that's that's unusual but sometimes oh. yes but even if i you know normally i would but and then you when... find something interesting to photograph right there just because you have your camera and that's what you do? Yes, but the other time, but of course with the, um, the popularity and the, the great technical advancements of iPhones, many times what I'll do, if I don't have my, all my cameras and lenses with me, I'll shoot for reference, look at the time and make notes and saying, because you know, during, as a photographer, we'll, we know that you only have a few minutes in the day, you know, yeah. morning and late in the afternoon for really great color. So many times I'll just do some reference photography and say, yeah. okay, right. I'm going to come back yeah. here at sun when the sun comes up tomorrow morning. Yeah, you know? yeah, I, I do that sometimes too. And, and I, I read uh, and hear that more and more photographers are doing that. They use their iPhone not as their primary instrument, but to do right. Uh, I think one of the things uh, I, I started following years ago, um, there was a quote by Jim Richardson, who's a great National Geographic photographer. And he was asked um, by some young people taking um, lessons from him, how do I become a better photographer? <laughs> and he said, you become a better photographer by standing in front of more interesting places. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. real simple. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a, a, a landscape photographer that's fairly prominent named Eddie Soloway. Mm -hmm. Does beautiful sort of atmospheric, evocative uh, landscapes. And I went to a half day seminar with him one time and his advice was similar. Somebody asked him about his um, use of an iPhone and he said pretty much what you said and how you use it. And then he said, oh, and whatever you're using, always turn around before you leave. Oh, absolutely. Always look behind. And so I do that all the time now too. I, uh, when we get into our work, I have a couple of examples of just that. Oh, great. Well, why don't we do that then? Okay. Uh, nice segue. So Martha, okay. if you'll give us the first pair. That, <laughs> I love this photo. So this is the whole setup, right? 
<laughs> this is just a setup. This is not a fine art photograph. <laughs> just to give you a flavor. Just real quickly go over, you know, where you are and, and uh, this is all your setup, right? Your vehicles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And where yeah, is this, We're out, I think that's at uh, Bryce Canyon in the, in uh, one of the parks in Utah. Yeah. And uh, that is our little 15 foot travel trailer. Um, which we have uh, a little living room, uh, you know, a, a bath and shower and a galley, uh, sleeps three if we needed to. Um, it's very lightweight, so it, we don't spend a lot of money in gas getting around. And that's uh, our uh, Honda pickup truck, which we use for years going back and forth. Um, everything we need is uh, between the truck and the, and the uh, trailer. Um, I, this is a very self-interested question. What's the longest trip you ever made with this setup? Uh, 3,000 miles each way, or 3,700 miles one way and 3,200 miles the other. So okay. we, we spent, uh, this was, I guess, four or five years ago, we, uh, we went out to Arizona, um, and, and then we left the trailer there, came back, and then several months later, went back to the trailer and then did another. So both trips, we... We lived in the trailer for about a, a month each. A month, a month, six weeks at the most. Yeah. And you're still married. We're still married. Well, yeah. Well, we also, you know, we also have lived on our boats uh, for more ah. than a year at a time. Okay. So we're used to small spaces. Yeah. yeah now, I'm trying to sell my wife on doing something like this, but she's not an artist, so it's a hard sell. <laughs> I, you know, there's so much. There's so much out there in this country, and uh, yeah. and again, the, the, uh, what I love about both of the adventures, whether it's the boat or the, the travel trailer, is the discoveries. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's not the Grand Canyon that, that are the, the best things. It's these little tiny towns and people and uh, places that uh, you didn't expect, you didn't plan on. Yeah, well, I think well, the other thing, Will, things you discovered then. So, yeah, aren't they? and the other thing, Will, is at, at the moment, think of this, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a very safe way yeah. to see the country right now during COVID because you have your own living space. You, you cook your own meals, you know, three yeah. times a day. Um, and you're, when you're in a campsite, you're out, you know, you're outside and you're fairly distanced from other people, you know? So yeah. it's one way to go see the country right now. Yeah. In 2019, I made a West, uh, uh, West, a trip out West <laughs> covered 5,000 miles in uh, about two and a half weeks. Wow. some of it on my bike uh and oh, uh, that's wow. exactly my experience it was all these little tiny towns out of the way places not the major landmarks uh that really provided me with more uh more subject matter that i thought was yeah. more meaningful right. to me so let's move along uh this was a painting i did i can't remember might have been in new mexico so we were we had been gone for maybe about two weeks and I'm, I'm feeling a little stressed because I haven't done a painting I like at all. And, you know, not that that was the objective of the trip, but you know, you just, you set some standards for yourself. So it was, uh, this was, I think, um, late October, November. So it was quite cool in the morning. So I took the truck, I went out and uh, found this dead end road and pulled off and started to set up my paints. And the, one of the cool things that happens to plein air artists is, are these surprises, not just the lighting, but the people you meet. And I don't know if you yeah. can tell there's two little dots on the road and another dot lower. Well, that was the most adorable couple who owned that house came walking up with their little dog named Henry, got to know him too, and just had this delightful conversation about their life and how long they'd lived there. So uh, to me, that's, that's such a plus of, plein air painting that you just yeah. don't get sitting in your studio. Yep. Um, this, <laughs> this scene reminds me of the drive up to O'Keeffe's Ghost Ranch. Mm. Have you ever been oh. there? No. no. Okay. It's the same kind of thing. Her, the, the house and the buildings and everything are up on one of these hillsides, but you kind of run up this road to the hills as you do here with the open pasture land. And when my wife and I visited some time ago now, I was not so much into photography, but I remember a sway back horse in the pasture 
that must have only been there because somebody, you know, wanted that horse to survive and thrive in its old age. And I right. did not have a camera, but I can see that horse like it's right beside me. Now. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Myself every time I think of it. So <laughs> yeah. you're, you did well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on. Wow. All George. right, this, uh, this is a, a good example of how we collaborate. We were, um, this was White Sands National Monument in New Mexico. And we spent the day there, Stacy was painting and I was roaming around shooting and it was just a miserable day. It was cold, very, very windy. And neither of us were happy with what, our, or what we were producing. Oh. Uh, so we kind of got cranky and I was put, putting my camera back in the car and Stacy was putting her uh, art supplies back in the, in the car. And all of a sudden she says, oh my God, look, there's, there's a bunch of guys or people on horses were getting ready to go up on their horses. They pulled in with a horse trailer and they were, you know, saddling up uh -huh. and that could be really interesting. So boom, I got my camera back out of the car and ran up uh, these hills. And these, they, they call them white sands, but it's actually not sand, it's gypsum. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same material that you have in sheetrock. Um, yeah. And it's very powdery. And to get up on that hill quickly, I just got up there quick uh, with a 70 to 200 uh, millimeter lens and try to capture them before they disappeared in the dunes. And I, I love this because of the shadows and the yeah. fact that it's, you're, you're wondering what the story is. What, who are these people? Where are they going? You know? And that's what I love about it because it's, it's really getting the viewer to look at this and wonder what is going on. Yeah. Not just, if just the sand dunes alone, I think would be beautiful, but not interesting. Yes, George, as an art historian, that's exactly the way I would have read this, the way I did read it. Uh, anybody with a decent camera that they know how to use even moderately well can take a beautiful picture of these sand dunes or anything like it. But it's that element, that human element, and as you said, uh, you're not quite sure what the story is, but that's what's intriguing and that's what draws you in. So you've really created a work of art. You haven't just clicked a shutter. Right. right. But it's still luck that you happen to be at the right place at the right time. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, and thanks to Stacy, I was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it is a beautiful photograph. Uh, I wish I had taken it. So what else do we have uh, to look at? Okay, so the next two are also an example how we both um, see or use the same subject matter, but differently. Uh, so again, we're living in, in St. Michael's and um, one of the things I like to do is just not always take my easel out on the road or uh, on land. On land. Uh, I'm an avid boater and we have a, a little 17 foot uh, skiff, a whaler. So I go out on the whaler and I set a forward anchor and a stern anchor. And that way I can get viewpoints um, that aren't usual. So this yeah. is the plein air piece. Uh, I was, it was just two weeks ago you know, when the weather just happened to be this beautiful window and the seas were flat. So um, this is of the St. Michael's Maritime Museum. Uh, you mentioned Payne Annapolis. Uh, <laughs> I do have a funny story, funny now. Uh, about six years ago when I was doing the quick draw, uh, for those of you that are not aware of it, it's an event where you have two hours to do a painting, you put it in a frame and then you bring it usually in Payne Annapolis's case down to um, the, the Susan B. Campbell um, Park there and it's judged and hopefully sold. Anyways, it was a beautiful day, flat seas. I said, well, I'm gonna go ahead and take the whaler out and I'm gonna do my uh, quick draw painting from the water view. So I'm uh, getting ready to anchor at the bottom of Market Street. I go to throw the anchor in and, and it hooks on a stanchion and I fall overboard. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so uh, being absolutely, and totally embarrassed because people saw me, I found the strength to climb aboard, set the anchor, did the painting, <laughs> even though I was sopping wet and bruised, did the painting, threw it in the frame, 
got down to a city dock, put it on display, and the judge came around and looked at it and she said, I really like your brushwork. It's so fluid. <laughs> <laughs> she did not no, know anyway, what she was saying. Know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that is a great story. Um, but it, it, well, George, do you have something that's paired with this then that we want to look at? Well, yes, in the sense that we're talking about the same subject matter and yeah. we were there uh, within days of each other. Uh, okay. So my next photograph is at this was this was shot at this uh, at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. Mm -hmm. And that's their uh, this that's their the one that Stacy painted was that one of the by boats. Uh -huh. And I I work as a volunteer photographer for the museum. Oh, okay. And I am documenting the building of the Dove, the uh, ship from yes. 1608 or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I go there every couple of weeks to shoot the construction and documenting the building of this. Um, and uh, while I was there, uh, there was a coffee break uh, for the uh, shipwrights. This is uh, Joe, who is the, the head shipwright, and that's his office. And he took a coffee break and I said, can I just kind of follow you in? And uh, these, what's really amazing to me is that the staff that are building the ship are all young fellows in their 20s, you know, late 20s at the most, maybe early 30s, but they, they know the skills of the old shipwrights. Wow. And I got such a kick out of Joe sitting down, having a cup of coffee for a break, picking up the banjo, and started singing, you know, bluegrass. And I just love being able to shoot this black and white, yeah. sort of simulating the old Tri-X days because I've done a lot of my, one of my jobs was a photojournalist. And I was just able to, to get him to get the right light with all natural light coming in. So in the sense that, you know, this was at the museum, but a totally different point of view yeah. than Stacy, but, being right, we only like three blocks from the museum. We get to use that as a great subject matter. Oh, yeah. 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 I wish I had something like that nearby. I think this is another uh, photograph of yours, George, that I, this is the kind of thing I like to shoot too. But living in the kind of suburban planned neighborhood that I live in, I don't have anything right. Well, come on over, Will. Come on over. <laughs> All right. I'll be there room. now. Is that guest room ready? Is that, have one guest room. <laughs> no, I will come over. I will take you up on that. But, okay. but uh, see, you didn't know what you were getting into, did you? Uh, <laughs> but let me ask one last question about these sort of shared uh, locales. And then I want to take each one of you a little bit through your own career as an artist with the other uh, pieces that we're going to look at. So when you're in a similar locale, however you got there, wherever it is, do you ever say to one another, you know, you might want to look over there. I noticed this. Sure. Okay. And after that happens, then when you each see what the other did at your suggestion, is there ever a little critique session? Absolutely. Yeah, all the time. All the time. All the time. <laughs> And, and, and that sort of, you would say, helps you move forward or think about different ways to approach your subjects because you're getting feedback, not just from another person whose opinion you value, but a person working in a different medium. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the collaboration has been wonderful. Uh, and we do collaborate on a regular basis. There's no question. I mean, I, will, I might see something and say, Stacy, I think you ought to... Yeah set up your easel there you know I mean she doesn't always agree with it but but yeah. we do collaborate back and forth and yeah, like I said nice. in the previous image and Two actually I, you know, an, an honest critique you know what I, one of the things I can't stand is when you you know you do something online and everybody's like oh that's so nice that's yes. so nice nobody will say anything concrete yeah so you know we we do give each other concrete uh Critique. critiques and yeah. it, that's yeah. what how you learn and you know, uh, we don't cause any trouble in the marriage doing that, you know, it's, yeah. but we're, I think being artists, I think we're, we can honestly critique each and it's very helpful. It's like yeah. having another set of eyes. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I, um, I don't have uh, a wife who is an artist. 
uh, she enjoys art, but she looks at it in a different way. And I'm always holding something up to her and asking for an opinion. And she'll right. say, well, that's nice, but why don't you do this? Because she has a different taste. And so does our son, who is my other okay. in, in-house in critic. Uh, okay. and, and they'll say, well, do this. And I say, yeah, well, other people do that really well, but that's not what I would do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I envy you. That's what I really <laughs> Uh, so I don't know, I don't remember who we have teed up first, uh, Stacy or George, but uh, now we're going to go through a couple of works by each of you individually. So right. let's see what pops up, Martha. Okay, well, that's not a photograph, so <laughs> no, <it's Stacey. laughs> um, a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of background without a lot. Um, so I was an undergraduate, I was an art education major, and you, to be an art education major, you have to um, take lots of different studio classes, because you don't know if you're going to be teaching photography, ceramics, painting, and we're certified kindergarten through 12th, so um, again, you have to be very flexible. So I was actually um, a 3D artist, a ceramicist. Um, for 20 years. I taught at Old Mill High School up near the, the airport and um, loved that whole process. But then, as George mentioned, we took a year off. I took a leave of absence and we uh, sold our cars, rented our house and took off on our boat for a year. So there was no way I was going to bring clay on the boat. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I segued to a watercolorist and I've always enjoyed the, the uh, transparency, the aqueous nature of watercolor and um, it's very portable. So, you know, living on a, on a boat with a, at that point, a, a 12 year old kid and our big dog, you know, you had, didn't have a lot of space to yourself. So that's how my watercolor career kind of started. And um, we're obviously both into the outdoors. We're not gonna do any rappelling off mountains, but we just both love hiking, being out in the outdoors. So that's how I kind of got into the whole plein air experience. Because uh, once you do it, you'll find that it's all the senses that are involved. Yeah. You know, obviously, to, you know, you've got the sight, but then you got the smells, you got the sounds, um, maybe even a taste here and there. But mm -hmm. uh, so this piece is a painting I did this fall uh, with a group. And that's another thing about plein air painting is there's lots of competitions. There's lots of uh, small groups that have what they call paint outs. And this one is the Chesapeake uh, plein air painters. And this is the uh, old railroad station in Easton, Maryland. So this was set up that anyone who wanted to go paint there, show up, you know, 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. And there was just two other painters there. And, uh, but, you know, it made me go there and a, a place I probably wouldn't have chosen because mm -hmm. I'm not big on architecture, but it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, I enjoy that, that camaraderie and again, the critique part. And of course, then usually um, ends up being several display or um, possibilities. So yeah. um, I've I, I love doing these plein air events. Well, I think this is, um, if I may, put on my art historian's hat. This reminds me in certain passages, especially in the lower right and up above in the middle of the uh, right-hand margin, that remind me of a couple of the most renowned American watercolorists. Uh, are there any particular watercolors that inspire you or interest you that you look at? Well, you know, John Singer Sargent, although he's in the 19th century, I mean, you, know, you can't look at his work enough because it's, it's just so pure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, um, Edward Harper, you know, Andrew Wyeth. Um, so, you know, Wyeth there's... was one I was thinking of, uh, especially his early watercolors that are more broadly uh, washed as you have here, but also Homer. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. The absolutely. foliage or the, the, the plants here, uh, mm -hmm. that's very much the kind of effect that I've seen in his work. Um, and when you mentioned Sargent, I think that's fascinating as a historian of American art because you know, once he said 
to uh, an interviewer about his um, portrait painting that, well, portrait painting was uh, something where there was always a little bit wrong around the mouth. <laughs> and, and he got into those watercolors that you admire because he got, you know, he stopped painting, even though he was an international celebrity in his portraits, he stopped to devote himself to his watercolors. And they are, I think, some of his most accomplished work. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So most plein air painters are, are oil painters. Um, watercolor certainly has its challenges being out in the elements. Yeah. You know, yeah. Obviously, if it's drizzling, that's yeah. not going to work well. But also the opposite. If it's a, it's a very hot, dry day, your right. washes, your, your layers are going to dry too quick. Last year, I was out um, around dawn uh, in a December morning because it was, there was some beautiful fog rays, uh, starting to lift. And as I'm painting, I'm thinking, what the heck is wrong with my yeah. paints? Why are they? Thin? And of course, it was because it was just about uh, 35 degrees and the wash was freezing. So oh, it really? was crystallizing. Ah. So, you know, there's there's challenges, but there's some happy surprises sometimes, too. Right. Well, we have a number of more works by both of you, and I really want to get uh, to look at them. But I see we're enjoying our conversation so much that we're already uh, 45 minutes in. And I really do want to show all the work and then leave people time to ask questions. So uh, let's see what's up next. Uh, George, this I was surprised is, when I saw this because I didn't really think this was the kind of thing you did, but this is stunning. Oh, thank you. This uh, <clears throat> is a uh, this is at the Japanese Gardens in outside of Portland, Oregon, and uh, I took this on a very. I was out there on assignment from a magazine uh, to do a story about taking a boat from Portland to Idaho, doing the. Lewis and Clark uh, trip backwards, you know, but I got a few days by myself in Portland and this is a Japanese gardens and this was on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and when I got there, the, the whole place was just full of tours. I mean, you couldn't move and um, no matter which, everybody was photographing the koi uh, mm -hmm. fish in the ponds, you know, Sure. And uh, I was very kind of uh, depressed because I, I couldn't see anything. There was so many people there. But I did. I walked by this tree area and I decided to climb under the tree, get off the path mm -hmm. and climb under the tree and kept crawling towards the trunk and saw this incredible sight and just shot this lying on my on my stomach and shooting up. And um when I got back uh, that afternoon and uh, downloaded my, my images, I, I was just so thrilled because I, yeah. I, I almost didn't see what I was shooting. You know? Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, it's just a stunning image, George. And this, uh, this, this? Has, won, this has won several awards. Actually, I'm very honored, Jay Fleming. Uh, oh. I won first place at River Arts uh, in Chestertown. Uh, for landscape photography, and Jay Fleming was the judge. Yeah, uh, and I've sold several of these prints. And recently, uh, for our new house, I had this reproduced on uh, white semi-gloss aluminum, uh, five inches, five feet wide, by forty inches high, uh, with a walnut frame to match the wood, oh. and it just came out to be a stunning image. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's stunning at this scale on my monitor. I can't imagine how impressive it is at that scale. Uh, right. While you were in Portland, did you visit the Rose Garden? Oh yes, and yeah. I have, you know, I have. I, I guess well, I, I guess uh, I have. Uh, oh gee, you know, five hundred photographs of roses. <laughs> well, I don't have that many, but I took a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's let's keep moving along. Okay. This is a, 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 a watercolor mono print. So it was painted, well, I did a um, value study first. And then what you do is you put the value study under a piece of plexiglass that has been slightly sanded, then gum Arabic over it. And then you actually paint on the plexiglass, let it dry. And then you put a piece of um, soaked print paper over it 
And my printing press is just a rolling pin. Uh, so then you pull, pull the print off. Uh, I do, when I did, when I can't do plein air, I do um, certainly still lifes in my studio, but I still am very partial to painting from life. So this was a series I called my stinky studio because I had um, all seafood. And of course, when it's sitting under the lights for a while, it gets a little stinky. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you explained the monoprint uh, because when I saw this, I couldn't imagine how you did a monotype uh, monoprint with watercolors. But now that you've explained it, it makes sense. And I love this because my wife and I and our family, we usually go to Maine in the summers and we mm. love lobster and eat it whenever mm. we can. So <laughs> this strikes a lot of chords for me. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, this uh, is a perfect example of what you mentioned before, uh, Will, about turning around, uh, doing mm -hmm. a, a 360. Uh, I was at the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Botanic Gardens uh, to shoot the orchids, and I got there on a day where there was a two school buses of kids <laughs> to, to uh, view the gardens, and there was no way I could shoot the flowers. Sure. And I was pretty despondent, um, but I had my, uh, my camera with me, of course, and I was sitting actually, or leaving uh, uh, pretty, pretty despondent and saw that there was this wonderful water fountain that they had. And I just turned around and put my, put my camera over the water and shot with the sensor parallel to the water. Uh, and I found these wonderful, you know, cool and warm colors and a concentric uh, circles. And yeah. uh, that is another one that has won some awards and sold quite a few prints. And I also had that uh, reproduced five feet tall by 40 inches wide. And that hangs in our main foyer of our home. Um, and uh, just one of those things, you know, I, I couldn't shoot what I wanted to, turned around and bam, there it was. Yeah. And um, you mentioned the way that you uh, framed it up and shot it. Is this cropped or is this the full image that you captured? This is this is pretty much the full image. Yeah. Uh, the full image that I that I shot. Yeah. Well, it's it's a beautiful uh, image. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, you I need to talk to you about how you're making all these sales other than the beautiful work. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so Stacy is uh, Stacy up next. Yep. Ah. Well, this is just an example of how, again, the, the surprise element is so important and also the work element. Uh, I would say maybe 15 to 20 percent of paintings I do are frame worthy. So um, this was a the second painting I was doing of some, some peonies. Uh, the first one I spent like two hours on it and there's an old adage in watercolor paint, painting that watercolor painting is like golf. The fewer strokes, the better. And it actually happened on this painting, my second one, because it, uh, it's a small piece. I did it on the back of a, a failed painting. And honestly, I was just having fun. And it, yeah. it has a je ne sais quoi that I think yeah. uh, <laughs> that, is, that works, put it that way. So, um, you know, just plugging away at those, that goal of 10,000 hours. And, um, you know, you just can't paint enough. Right. George, what do you say to that as a photographer? Uh, what Stacy just said struck the chord with me, and I've always respected artists in other media who have to really think about the expense of material, the time that it create takes to create something, and then you know that mostly it's not going to meet your expectations. As a photographer, a digital photographer, I just shoot away, you know, and I don't have that pressure. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel yes and no. Uh... Well, in the sense that uh, I've learned to kind of slow down as a digital photographer. I mean, I would say a couple of years ago, I was more into the shoot and run uh, mm -hmm. mentality. And I've really kind of slowed down now. I'm, I'm using a tripod more now um, and trying to really think more about 
uh, what the composition is, get it right in the camera. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm becoming a better photographer by slowing down. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, uh, that resonates with me. The idea that you have a, a concept, uh, a, some idea of what it is you're trying to do, uh, and I've always been a little more like that. I've never been one, even though what I just said might have made you think I was. I'm not somebody that'll just shoot, you know, a hundred uh, right. images right. of one subject. I might only shoot three or four, but I just keep shooting. You know, right. as I go through the day if I have my right. camera with me. Right. Okay. Um, we are really pushing the hour. Guess, so let's, let's go one more. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is uh, kind of a social justice, I guess, photograph, if you will. Um, this was shot the same weekend as the Portland uh, Japanese Garden. This is downtown Portland, Oregon, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, I just couldn't resist uh, grabbing this shot of a homeless fellow sitting out on the sidewalk with all his belongings and a sign, um, you know, looking for uh, donations or whatever. And inside this restaurant was, you know, a guy eating a big sandwich. And it just, it really struck me. And that's why I've, I've entitled it Have and Have Nots. Yeah. Um, and um, anyway, this, uh, uh, has been uh, juried into the Ocean City Art Leagues, and it's now hanging in, Ocean, in the Ocean City Gallery uh, as part of the uh, Best of 2020 show for street photography. Well, congratulations. It is a very compelling image. And as a photographer, uh, and in a general sense also, I wanted to ask you, um, did you approach the homeless man and engage him before you took the photograph or after? I did it afterwards. Uh, I, I was walking along and I just, I, I saw that image of the fellow in the restaurant looking out and I thought I got to grab that. And I yes. had a, I, I did have a long lens on luckily at the time. So I was able to shoot it. But I, I after the shot, I went over, uh, just spoke briefly uh, to the gentleman, you know, the homeless mm -hmm. guy and, uh, you know, put some money in his bucket. Mm -hmm. And uh, just chat. He really wasn't in the mood to chat much. Yeah. Uh, and I've I've done some of this also in New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore. Um, and I always try to engage if I can. Yeah. Yeah. I do the same. Yeah. I do the right. same. My last question though is the fellow uh, in the restaurant looks like he's making eye contact with you. Was he? I don't. I don't see how he could have because I was way across the street. This was with a 200 millimeter lens and I don't see it, but, it, but darn it, if when I got it back uh, and I downloaded, I said, my goodness, the guy is, is making eye contact with me, yeah. but I really don't see how he did, you know? Yeah, well, it, you, then you got really lucky because I yeah. think that's part of what makes it so compelling that he I does know. seem to be sort of resentful that somebody is observing him eating with this man that you that's exactly what i thought when i saw that it looks like oh boy he he was caught almost you know yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay well what do you have one more slide i think i, think that's, I think that's it oh that's it okay well i've really loved our conversation and i'd love to continue it sometime and i hope that we'll be able to do that but uh to be fair to our audience i uh, i see all these loyal regular um uh, watchers and listeners. So let's give them a chance to ask you questions. Uh, okay. Sure. Who's, who's got a question? Chris. Unmute. Oh, there you yep. go. Okay. Um, it's sort of a cliche, of course, that couples as they age tend to come to resemble each other. I was wondering, um, has each of your individual work been affected by the others? I, good question. I don't, I don't really think so. Thank you. Um, I don't think affected, but again, just loving the fact that we can bounce things off of each other. But, um, you know, I have obviously a very loose painter and honestly, I do make a mess and, um, 
you know, George is a very technical guy. Okay. Well, I think too, the interesting thing, Stacy is a, uh, is educated in the world of art. And I came from a totally different uh, world uh, and self-taught photography. So there are times when I ask her questions to help me uh, either with composition or values of tonalities or whatever that, you know, her background helps me. I, I think we help each other, but I don't, I wouldn't call it um, affecting the work that much. I think it's helpful, uh, but it doesn't make me change things or look at things differently, honestly. Yeah. That's, you know, that's the way I would have read it if I was, you know, asked, if I was asked that question of you as, right. you know, as an art historian, that's what I would have said just from our conversation. So yeah. that's, that's yeah. interesting, though, that you're not more affected, but you're helped and your work right yeah we, we're very we're very in we're really strong individuals you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any other questions martha you see everyone right yes i can yeah okay well um if there aren't any other questions i uh, i think that i will just to thank both of you for such a lively and interesting conversation. I think that um, you've got a really great team there and you're doing great work and thanks for sharing it with us. Thank you very much. Well, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was well, a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I have to say, too. well, when I was teaching high school for 30 years, I, I did field trips to the National Gallery every semester. And it was only once in 1983 did I lose two kids. <laughs> Well, that's actually pretty good. That's a good score. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank all of you who uh, attended uh, tonight and participated. And as always, Martha, thanks for your excellent technical support. So see you all again soon. <laughs>